sure you open your book to Peter. And this won't take me too long, but uh, I want us to review just a little bit on the history of this book and the theme of this book. And so we'll look just at the beginning of Peter and, and this Bible, it tells us the theme of the book. And uh, the dominant theme of Peter is that the willingness of the part of the believers is to face persecution and suffering for the name of Christ. We have to realize the times. The book was written in 63. Uh, James died in 62. And now we come to in 64, 65, Peter will be martyred. Uh, the book was written in Babylon. And, uh, but how did uh, Peter then is, is, is martyred in, in Rome? So you always ask the question, how did that happen? And uh, first of all, uh, the gospel spread so fast in the early church. It, threw, it, it spread throughout the known world within 20 years or less probably. It just spread very fast. So now uh, Peter is in Babylon. How does he get to Rome to be martyred? Well, we know that uh, Nero, and that's in history, was a, was a crazy man. And he burnt Rome. And uh, he burnt Rome because he loved to build things. And uh, he, he figured he was deity. He could do that. Now, the pressure on Nero was that he did something very foolish, and the people of Rome were very angry with him. They, and we think of the fires in, in Hawaii, uh, and how many people were killed there. There must have been many people killed in Rome. And so what he does is he begins to blame who? The Christians, the new sect that is in Rome. And now uh, Peter is going to be sent it is believed he was sent there to Rome to encourage the Christians to stand and be strong in their faith in Christ and not give up. And so we find before that, uh, the persecution was out of Jerusalem and the people were being scattered abroad because of that. And I always, in Matthew 24, this is what was going on at that time, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So we know that Satan has the power of death. And as soon as the truth of God came into being, he wants to destroy it. And so he begins his rampage of, of killing people that believe in the gospel. And then it says here in verse 10, and then shall many be offended. Many within the Christian church were offended at the persecution that was having and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And so this was a terrible time for the Christian church. And Peter is sent to Rome uh, to encourage the believers and he finds martyrdom there in Rome in 64, 65. So the book was written in 63, and uh, just a year or two later, he is going to be martyred in Rome. And so he is encouraging the Christians here to suffer for Christ too. And uh, uh, that is what he is encouraging them to do. And as we review a little bit uh, from last time I spoke, uh, he tells them to be good citizens. And then he tells servants to be obedient to their masters. And he says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. And then husbands, consider your wife. He tells us all those things. And then he gives us reasons for each one of these things. Being a good citizen, he tells us, so we can show them how foolish they are in believing that we are evil. And then uh, to be a good servant, 
to be obedient to your master. He goes to Christ and he says, Christ was a servant and he left us an example that you should follow in his steps. And then he goes to the wife and says, be submissive to your husband. For what purpose? But to win your husband to Christ. And then for the husband to consider his wife is so that his prayers may be answered. And so he tells us all those things. And then we come to where I want, we left off, verse 8, and we'll go 8 through 18. And uh, let's read that. So, and it says here, finally, be all of you of one mind, having compassion, one of another, loving as brethren. Be pitiful, be courageous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, like our Lord Jesus Christ, but counterwise blessings, knowing that you therefore are called that ye shall inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. In other words, don't fight back. Let him eschew evil, separate himself from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eye of the Lord is over the righteous and his ears are open unto his prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Nobody will harm you. But and except, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as an evildoer, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put in the death, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so let's pray. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you uh, for your word. And uh, Lord, there's some very difficult verses here even to us who who live in primarily a peaceful world. And uh, Lord, help us to apply these things to our life. Uh, just help us to be as you would have us to be, we do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's remarkable that uh, some of the uh, unbelievers in history have studied Peter and, and the other portions of the New Testament and come up with, uh, and we, I'm talking about Gandhi, who came up with a nonviolent resistance. And he believed that, which is exactly what Peter is teaching us here. And he believed that it would disarm his opposition. And Gandhi, Gandhi was a man who was, was a Hindu. He uh, lived in India in the upper class of the Hindus, and his dad sent him to London to become a lawyer. And uh, he was influenced by Christianity, uh, but he, he rejected Christianity for, he said for some missionary, didn't say it right to him or something, offended him, and he rejected Christianity but yet he learned much from the New Testament. Uh, Gandhi, I guess he came back to India. He uh, uh, failed as a lawyer in India. He ended up in South Africa and he defended the Indian people that were there in South Africa. And uh, then he moved back to India 
and he was very much against the colonization of, of India. Uh, he did not agree that Britain should rule their country. And so he was a nationalist, and he started a movement of nonviolent resistance towards uh, the British Empire. And where did he learn that? But from the scriptures. And this is exactly what Peter is going to teach us as we, we study these verses. Uh, and it's remarkable, one of, I wrote down his, one of the things that he said, uh, he says, my ambition, this is what Gandhi says, he wrote, is no less than to convert the British people through nonviolence, and there make them see the wrong that they have done to, the, to India. So it's similar to what the New Testament teaches. Uh, Peter teaches us that uh, his goal was to convert people and to let them see the truth. And so it's very similar. And the movement was very successful. I mean, he, he conquered the greatest empire in the world, uh, Britain and uh, uh, Britain ruled the whole world at this time. Uh, and uh, so we find others that have applied this nonviolent resistance that's taught in the Word of God, and we think of Martin Luther King Jr., who, who protested in the Civil Rights Movement and uh, made us all realize that it's wrong to treat, just because a person is black, to treat them badly. And uh, he always said that he wanted to be judged not by the color of his skin, but by his character. And then there was Nelson Mandela, and I don't know if you guys can remember him. I, I sure can remember him and, and the apartheid of South Africa. And the British ruled there too. And uh, he wanted the blacks to have a right to vote and to be part of the political system. He too was like, Martin Luther King Jr. was a Christian, and he too was of the Christian world, and he spent many times, much time in jail because of his nonviolent resistance towards Britain. And I can still remember, I don't know how old I must have been, but I can remember Billy Graham said, I will not go to South Africa when the apartheid rules there. And he, he would not, but uh, uh, he, they, that protest uh, gave the freedom for the black people to rule themselves. So, so it's interesting as we will look at some of these things that Peter is teaching us, he is teaching us to not be violent, but to resist the paganism of our world. And he says by doing that, we will show them how wrong they are. And so, we come to uh, verse 8 of chapter 3, and he begins to say, finally. Now, he's not ending his epistle. He is now going to talk to all of us. He talked to certain classes of people before that, and now he's going to talk to all of us. He says, finally, be ye all. So he's talking to all of us of one mind. Be of one mind. And uh, this becomes quite difficult as we look at the church today. It, it surely is not of one mind. That is to think the same. Be of one mind. Think the same. And he wanted harmony within the body of Christ. And we don't see that today. Uh, and it's very difficult because of all the different doctrines that are out there. And uh, a lot of times, being of one mind, it is the ones that study the Bible that give up truths to create this oneness, so-called oneness. And that is not what the Word of God is teaching. Uh, he's, he teaches us to follow the Word of God. And when we follow the Word of God, yes, seek peace, it says in... In verse 11, he says, seek peace and ensue it. We are to do that, but we need to stand for the word of God. And, and there was an old statement, uh, and I wrote that down. It says, in the fundamentals, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, in everything, love. 
And uh, I really find, as I looked at that, how wrong that statement is. We do have in, in our doctrinal statement, two-step statement, we have the fundamentals, which we all need to agree upon to meet here. And then we have secondary doctrines. And I, I certainly don't want us ever to think they're non-essential doctrines. And I think this is manifested in the church. A lot of people believe in the unity based on the fundamentals, but they have no conviction on other doctrines. And they give up all that truth uh, just to, to live in unity and to go to a certain church. And I, I really think it is, is detrimental to the church. We do need to be of one mind, but we need to stand for the word of God. And don't ever think the doctrines of God are non-essential. And they are essential. And I always commend Carl uh, coming from California. Before he came, he, he searched churches that he felt were following the word of God. And praise God, he ended up here. But uh, I, I, I really believe that. A lot of Christians, they'll just go to any church. Uh, they don't study the scriptures and have convictions on what the word of God says. But Peter wants harmony now, especially as suffering is coming. And they were living in suffering. And they are not living in the worst suffering. Because Rome is going, and what happens in Rome is going to be much greater than what's happening here uh, in, in the Middle East. And there is suffering here. But he says, have compassion. And that means long suffering. Be long suffering with people. Have compassion. And who are you to have compassion with? Other Christians, one another. And then he tells us to love. Who do we love? but one another, the brethren. And I, I, I really think, uh, and, and you study the scriptures and uh, you find that this, is, this commandment is given over and over and over again to love the church. And uh, I'm, I know Christians who, who don't go to church. They don't go to church. And I have to wonder to what degree they love the brethren. But I want us to turn just to one area we'll turn to, and that's 1 John chapter 3. And thinking of loving the brethren. And it says this, if the children of God are manifested, what does it mean to be manifested? But it means to be seen. People can see it. Uh, it is manifested. And the children of the devil are manifested. Whosoever does not, right, does not do righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother is not of God. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And the emphasis is the commandment that Christ has given us is to care for one another. Not as Cain, who was in competition with his brother, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew him? Because his works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we Love the brethren, the love the church. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and he that he and ye that know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We perceive that God loves us. And we ought to lay down our lives for each other, is what it tells us. And so as we think of this theme, this theme is throughout the, the Bible of loving the brethren, loving the church. And then be pitiful. And, you know, we, 
We need to have pity on each other. And especially in a time of suffering, uh, people don't have things. We know that they were scattered. They were scattered up into Turkey. And when you're scattered, what do you do? You lose your home. You lose your job. You lose your money. Uh, you have nothing. And I think of what uh, James talks about. If a brother and sister come to you naked and destitute of daily food, and you say, well, be blessed and go on your way, and you, notwithstand you give them not those things that are needed for the body, what kind of faith is that, he asked that question. What kind of faith is that? And so we need to have pity on one another, and especially as we know that Peter is writing to a suffering church, and then be courteous to one another, respect each other, even if we don't have things, they don't have things, let us respect each other. Be courteous to one, one another. And then as Christ is the example, Christ is the example, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. But contrary to that, we are to bless. Now, I don't know when you're, I worked in a place where there was a lot of people and you had a lot of time, opportunities to talk about the Lord with people. And uh, they would say some pretty evil things to you. And sometimes you would, you would respond back with evil. And he would rail to you like you're a gullible person to believe these things. And you sometimes would rail back at them. And he's telling us, don't do that. We must be nonviolent. And he says, contrawise, give them a blessing. Be kind to those that rail against you and do evil against you. And we know the story of Christ. And at the Calvary, that's what he did. Uh, they railed at him and he said, forgive them or they know not what they do. But we are a people that are going to inherit a blessing. Uh, so eternity is in mind as Peter writes this. Peter knew that we're not going to be here very long, and uh, a blessing is coming. We, we're going to hear, inherit a blessing, so to, let us, as people, give that blessing to others. And then we come through 10 through 13 of these verses, and it tells us the general principles of life. And uh, he tells us, for he that will love life, you want to live, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile or deceit. And we know no guile was in our Lord. Uh, let us not be deceitful with other people. Let him eschew evil, separate himself from evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So we're to be peaceful people. And then, for the eye of the Lord is on the, over the righteous, and again, his ear is open unto their prayers. If ye be, okay, open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And so we find that the Lord is against those that do evil, even if we do evil. The Lord is against that. And then gives us a, what will protect us in a world that is very violent. It says here, and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? So within the, the doctrine of nonviolent resistance, our goodness will protect us. And that's what it says in the general principles of life. But then we come to verse 14 and there's exceptions. But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, so there's exceptions. And we know that uh, Peter who wrote this uh, found himself part of that exception and he died for Christ. And But he says the attitude that we must have for suffering is that it's a privilege. That's the only way we can go into it. 
suffering for Christ's sake is a privilege. It's something that, uh, how would I say, uh, will be a mark on us for eternity. Men who have suffered for Christ and lived for Christ through suffering will be glorified beyond comparison to those that need not go through those things. So happy are you, it says. And then, so that becomes difficult to do. And then the, the latter part becomes difficult to do, but we know Peter did it by faith. And he, and be not afraid of their terror. Well, I get kind of afraid, especially if somebody wants to beat me up. <laughs> uh, I get afraid. Neither be troubled. And we always think of Peter and how he died. He wasn't afraid. He believed the word of God that this, he, he is going on to the next life. And then we've been, and, and I encourage you to come out to uh, uh, prepare to stand. That Brunson, uh, Andrew Brunson, shared this last week, and that that the the way to prepare for suffering is to do what verse fifteen says. It says, "Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Love the Lord. Put Him a special place in your heart before suffering ever comes." Have him uh, to be your Lord and sanctify the Lord in your hearts. And that will prepare you for suffering. That's what we learned in that last lesson. And then as we come to the latter part of verse 15 here, it is, is the need to have substance in your Christian life. Uh, each one of us, uh, the word of God says we should be studying the things of God. Uh, read books on apologetics. Read Christian literature. Uh, prepare yourself to be more than I believe, but an understanding of the word of God. Because he says here, be ready always to give an answer to every man. You know, it's, it's terrible when somebody asks you something and you're not prepared to answer them. And he wants us prepared. He wants us to be people that know the word of God, that ask you of the reason of the hope that is in you, but do it with meekness and fear. And we know meekness is being trained in the things of God and knowing who God is and uh, so on, and with fear. So there's meekness, knowing that God is so great, as we share this, this worship and the fear of God, that someday I'm gonna be judged how I live my life. And then the best definition of this uh, doctrine of nonviolent resistance is found in verse 16. It says, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, and they were speaking evil of Christians in those days, very much so to the extent that they were going to kill him. They were speaking evil of you as evildoers. They may be ashamed at their false accusations. So they may be ashamed of it and, and your good conversation in Christ so that they would be ashamed. So you overcame the opposition by living a good life and standing for Christ. And, uh, for he says, it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer. And so the Lord says it's better that if we suffer, let us suffer for doing good and not doing evil. And uh, then we come to verse 18, and uh, it tells us here in verse 18 that our great example is Christ Jesus himself. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. Now we are suffering uh, in, in Peter's time. We aren't, <laughs> but in Peter's time, the just for the unjust. And we may be just, and we're just, and we are now suffering so that the unjust can hear the gospel. 
And uh, we find that he might bring us to God. And he did bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so as we look at these verses, we see that it is verses about suffering and about standing for Christ and not being violent when you stand for Christ or arrogant. We do not uh, respond evil for evil or railing for railing, but our example is Jesus Christ. And we seek to have peace with other people and tell them about Christ. And uh, sometimes it's quite difficult, uh, which it sure was in those days, but we know that Satan has the power of death. And as soon as the church blossomed in the early church, what does Satan want to do but destroy it? And uh, he sought to destroy it, but uh, it, it actually gets stronger during times of persecution. So let's just close with prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for these words and uh, help us to apply it to our lives that... Uh, we not be an arrogant people, but we, we try to respond in peace and in love and telling them the truth of Christ. And uh, uh, help us to do that. I, I know that our flesh likes to respond in anger and railing and so on. And help us not to do that, but help us to stand for you and to be like you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.